So again, yes, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Victoria McPhail. I'm the coordinator of the Center for Bee Ecology Evolution Conservation. And we're pleased to present this webinar series with the Packer Lab at York University. This is a monthly webinar series that actually is happening on the last Wednesday of every month at 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, so I encourage you to check it out on our website, yorku.ca slash bees slash packer. You can already pre-register for the next three talks, I believe it is in the series, to get the notifications in the Zoom link. So I encourage you to check it out uh, as soon as you're able to. And just a reminder, this is a Zoom webinar, which means that only the panelists can turn their camera and microphones on. If you have questions um, for the presenter, Dr. Asher, please use the Q&A box. You can see that at the bottom of your screen uh, to put your question. And at the very end of the presentation, we'll pose those questions back to the speaker. Um, we're using the chat box right now to share where you're from, because it's kind of neat for these international webinars to see who is attending from where. But otherwise, please keep the chat box sort of free um, and put the questions in the Q&A box. If you're having issues during the presentation, feel free to message me um, as the host, uh, Victoria McPhail, or you can email bc at yorku.ca. This presentation is being recorded and we post it to our YouTube channel later on, possibly today, but more likely next week. And I encourage you also to follow and subscribe our YouTube channel and you get notifications for any talk that we post. I also want to share the land acknowledgement statement and have you consider as well for your own area. So York University is located in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And we recognize that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tikaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wandat, and the Metis. Okay, there we go. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. And this territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampon Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. And as I mentioned, I encourage you to think about um, who is the ancestral caretakers of the land you are on or have done research on, and who is there currently. This is a really neat website that actually works globally, native-land.ca, or again, you can zoom into your area and learn more about the Indigenous peoples um, for that region. region. Now with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Packer to introduce our speaker. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, speaking here to you today from Yellowknife Northwest Territories. It's 62 degrees north. Uh, it is minus 30 outside, which is quite warm. It was minus 41 on Monday morning. So I'm talking to you from Chief Dry Geese Territory, which is part of the Yellow Knives Dene First Nation. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce John Asher to you today. Um, John studies global bee and wasp biodiversity, as I think everybody here knows, uh, with a current focus on Southeast Asia, where he's lived and worked since 2013. One of his key goals is to develop the tech taxonomic biogeographic infrastructure needed to support studies of insect ecology, behavior, and conservation. He continually improves global literature, specimen, and citizen science databases re relevant for investigating global and regional patterns of bee and wasp diversity. Uh, through collaboration with colleagues in the region and beyond, he's discovering new bee species and life histories and improving knowledge of the distribution and identification of already known species. Long-term goals include improving data quality for large-scale global data sets for bees so that these can be mobilized efficiently for species distribution modeling and other statistical analyses needed to assess the status of bees. So with no further ado, John Asher from the National University of Singapore. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Lawrence. Uh, it's great to be here and I really appreciate the invitation and the wonderfully diverse uh, audience. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I should attempt to share my screen. Yeah, it looks good. Hope this is working out. I hope this is working out okay. So it's uh, just after uh, midnight here in Singapore. It's uh, hot like it is every day and every night, always without exception. 
So I've been uh, an assistant professor since about 2013 at National University of Singapore, and I'm also a research associate of American Museum of Natural History and the Lee Kong Chan Natural History Museum, which used to be the Raffles Museum in uh, Singapore. So my talk will be global, but I'll give quite a few examples from Asia where I've been living and working. This is a Euaspis basalis. It's one of the about 10% of bees that are parasitic, and this is from uh, Japan. So uh, for those who know me and want to uh, update on what I've been doing, or those who don't know me, this is an example of my lab on a, a field trip. And you can see uh, my, my lab members and uh, associates, including uh, Zestin So from N Parks, who will be featured soon, and then our Malaysian colleagues. So in this case, we're visiting the Malaysian uh, Genome Institute to learn about their sequencing and their assessment of honeys. And then we went to this stingless bee farm where we are here and then went out in the field to try to discover new species. So this is an example of, of something I've been doing in Asia as recently as uh, this last weekend. So I took a team on a photo safari to the local forest about an hour uh, north of Singapore. And we had a particular goal to locate and document, especially through photographs and videos, a set of bees that has gone extinct uh, from Singapore due to the urbanization. And so uh, this team of very enthusiastic young people and expert uh, photographers is out there uh, trying to find as many bees as possible, which is not easy because you can see it's a very tall dipterocarp forest. And in this opening, uh, it's a bit sunnier it's still hard to find the bees due to some very scattered flowers, but we were able to find some. And uh, this is showing uh, some of the, the discoveries. So we achieved our, our main goal. The set of four bees on the left are examples of species that used to live in Singapore. In some cases, that were, they were found by Alfred Russell Wallace himself in about 1854. But uh, nowadays, we can't find them, and we think they've been lost due to uh, destruction or degradation of the native forests. But by going just a bit north in Malaysia, we were able to locate uh, some of these. And also, we were able to document through uh, photographs much better than these by the real photographers, unlike, unlike me, and also uh, videos, the behavior and how they buzz pollinate this uh, melastoma to extract the pollen. And then finally, we look at the stingless bee nests uh, and try to see how the structure of the nest and the placement varies in the giant trees of the real rainforest, as opposed to the urban adapted sting stingless bees that we see in Singapore, who may have different access to resins. And uh, in going to Johor, we're also trying to improve the species checklist for Johor, which is his historically very uh, limited and, and poorly known. Um, some species are new to science. The one in the upper right we think is an undescribed species of heterotrigona. So even though these stingless bees are very famous, we're not aware of an available name for this very common uh, species across the Sundaic uh, region. Um, and so just in this short uh, uh, weekend, just last weekend, we were able to add several species new for the fauna of Johor and also able to document these uh, missing species in Singapore. So this talk won't focus uh, too much on my research in Singapore, but we're doing a lot of different things. Here I list some of our activities. Uh, we've had a fair amount of, of press and engagement with uh, policymakers and the public and also with uh, the local uh, secondary school. And then we have a field guide to the bees of Singapore. And the photographs are by my colleague Zestin, who also came on our field trip. And so because we are thoroughly familiar with the bees species that are in Singapore and we photograph them uh, in high resolution, we know what the field ID characters are. This allows us to efficiently go to Johor and to um, when we encounter new species, they really stand out um, because we really know the Singaporean ones in a lot of detail. And so in addition to uh, just documenting the bees themselves, we're trying to study and document and share with the public their life histories. So you can see an example of a bee hotel that's been put up by Singapore Singapore N Parks in Hort Park, which is a horticultural uh, display park in Singapore. And for the bee, uh, bee fans out there, you might be interested to know that we have 
Anthidiellum, uh, Smithii, and uh, Euaspis, Polynesia, and other interesting bees uh, coming into these holes. And then you can see a set of young people uh, at a bio blitz. And so at this particular one, we got out our tropic nets and we're netting uh, very interesting and possibly new species of Hylias from the tall trees, the Syzygium in particular. So uh, in Asia, uh, it's a very poorly known place in general. And so to build checklist and build capacity, we've been collaborating with uh, many different countries. Um, in the upper left, you can see uh, a visit to Royal University of Phnom Penh in Cambodia. And we work with the Cambodian Entomology Initiative, which is something that was founded with uh, USAID and Belgian support uh, to foster these young Cambodian entomologists. We gave them DNA barcoding training and we went on an expedition out in the field and produced a checklist of the bees of Cambodia. Uh, below that, you can see a visit to the National Collection in Indonesia, where we uh, looked in great detail at their stingless bees and other bees. And then uh, the middle upper is a visit to Natapot Wari, who has a thriving lab in Bangkok, and it's the de facto center of Thai bee research. So we went there this summer did some field trips and added uh, more species to the Thai uh, fauna. And then below that is our, our Chinese partners. And they're actually relevant to the global patterns because uh, some of the co-authors and leaders of that uh, uh, study, in addition to me, were from uh, China-based uh, investigators. So there you can see uh, Natapot, Paul Williams, who's the big uh, uh, bumblebee expert for, for uh, China in particular, who's uh, our global expert, uh, Wu Yanru is the leading, you can see her, she's the leading ex uh, describer of Chinese bees of all time, and Chao Dong Zhu, who's our host, and uh, Pierre Razmont, and Michael Orr uh, with the beard, who is involved in uh, this bee mapping and modeling that I'll get to in a minute. And then Dr. Niu in the blue shirt is a big describer of bees. So an important thing recently is we brought together, despite the difficulties, the Chinese, the Indian and uh, Southeast Asian uh, uh, bee experts to meetings. There's a poster there from our Bangalore meeting, which was one uh, a couple of the first ones. There have also been meetings in Beijing and other places. And by bringing these different people together, we're able to reconcile some of the taxonomic and other difficulties and put together a group that can advance conservation. And uh, in particular, under the auspices of IUCN, uh, we have built a wild bee specialist group, and Natapot's lab has produced this wonderful logo with the giant honeybee, the uh, Wallace's giant resin bee, and then uh, Ceratinidia, a colorful Ceratina, to represent uh, our region. And so, so far, um, the only conservation assessment that's completed is for Singapore, and I showed that here, and you can see there's a set of nationally extinct, the black red wedge, and critically endangered, the red wedge. And these were the ones that we can't find in Singapore. Therefore, last weekend, we made an expedition to Malaysia to try to document them and their behavior in a place where they still uh, persist. So um, we've been really building a big partnership in Asia, and it's uh, linking up with policymakers and potential funders, all kinds of young people and uh, an array of international experts, including Europeans um, and people from all parts of Asia. So we've been meeting together with people from different countries. This was our meeting in Beijing. And then I've also been working uh, in other places like Taiwan, for example, on the Smithsonian uh, course. And so each of these visits to these major collections is a chance to uh, build the checklist and get some field experience directly with the fauna. And so this uh, culminated in a recent paper, uh, which is going to be the focus of this talk, where with the China-based uh, collaborators, we mapped and modeled world bees combining the public uh, specimen records and other records, and also uh, my checklist to make uh, this map and the map layer and uh, models. So why do we care about bees? I think uh, those attending this talk should be well aware that certain bees have declined and disappeared. In particular, uh, Bombus franklini uh, is an example of a bee that may actually be extinct already. It used to be in California and Oregon, and it's been listed as federally endangered by the US government um, very recently. 
And so this is uh, a genuine case of uh, indisputable B decline. And as long ago as 2007, the need to establish a baseline data for bees and to uh, document their status was explained uh, by the National Academy of Science in a report led by Steve Bookman and others. And so this laid the groundwork for some of the uh, some of the acquisition of, of data that I'll be talking about in a second. So um, there's been much ensuing hoopla. A lot of it has, especially when the celebrities are involved, it's about the, the honeybee in particular. And this makes sense because of their importance in food production and the amount of value of their pollination service. And also there have been some honeybee declines, but the wild bee declines are less well known. Uh, many of the declines are not well characterized. They may have little or nothing to do with the threats to honeybees. And globally, the status of most bee species is still an unknown. So even in the best known region, which is the European Union, that has done uh, an IUCN red listing effort for the species of a large area, so namely Europe, uh, they found about 50% of species are data deficient. And unfortunately, the set of species that don't have data is likely to include the set of species that are genuinely very rare and uh, at real risk of extinction or, or loss. So um, if you can't assess half of the species, and those are likely to include a lot of your genuinely rare species, then it's clear a lot more work needs to be done. And the rest of the world is actually way behind uh, Europe in, in uh, this red listing. So there are papers that report global declines, and I'm not trying to unduly criticize this paper. Uh, it's been cited nearly 6,000 times already and is, is quite important. But uh, some things to point out is that it's not clear to me what the evidential basis for this is. Uh, and when you see the mapping of public data and see some of the gaps, you can start to wonder uh, whether we really know uh, global trends and declines when we don't have public data for bees for much of the world. And this is uh, like the majority of high impact studies about bee uh, diversity. Um, it's really uh, lacking in authorship with uh, global taxonomic and biogeographic expertise uh, for reasons that are not really entirely clear to me. That seems to be the trend. Um, so some honeybees uh, are genuinely declining, but these are some figures that I found on the on the web that maybe suggest that um, all of the uh, public attention to honeybees and the celebrity attention and the funding and uh, big journal attention to the status of honeybees may be somewhat misplaced if our goal is biodiversity conservation. And uh, anecdotally, I can say that on the iNaturalist, which I frequent, the Western honeybee is by far the most frequently observed species globally. And this is in spite of the fact that many uh, savvy nature photographers don't even bother to photograph honeybees because they're too commonplace. But still, it's the most widely reported species in Asia. The Asian honeybee, Apis serrana, is the most common species in the region where I am now. So honeybees may be declining, but it seems like objectively they're doing better than uh, many, if not most, of the other species. And at least from the standpoint of uh, biodiversity conservation in the new world, uh, they, to me, they fall in the category with your, your cows and uh, other domestic animals and feral pigeons and things of that ilk uh, more than they do high quality uh, biodiversity. In Asia, uh, where I live now, the honeybees are largely native, and uh, but there's much less uh, hoopla about them, even though here in this region, they actually do uh, represent native uh, biodiversity. So when I think of bees, I'm often thinking of, of other species that are quite different in their life history and appearance than the honeybee. So these are bees that I photographed in China. So just like Malaysia and many other parts of the world, uh, actually doing biodiversity discovery science is very, very difficult for a number of uh, reasons. But you can do a photo safari. Um, and so, again, this is this is what I did. Uh, the For the bee aficionados, the ones in the upper left is a, a rare species of Trichusa called Trichusa cornopes. Uh, the female was gathering resin below the Great Wall, and the male is actually perched on the Great Wall of China uh, looking for his his mate. And so this is an example of a 
a bee that's very rare and until recently very poorly known. So when I went to the national collection in Beijing to try to identify it, I couldn't find any of them in the main collection, even though it's a very distinctive species. And it wasn't until I looked in the type collection that I found examples that had been identified by Wu Yan Ru. So in Asia, a large proportion of the bee species are only known from primary type material in uh, ancient uh, collections. Uh, most of these have not been digitized, or if they are digitized, they're not properly uh, labeled or accessible uh, to researchers. Um, I also show examples of uh, bumblebees. So China, and uh, in particular, is the world epicenter of honeybee, uh, sorry, bumblebee species uh, richness, and also possibly of threats to uh, bumblebees. And then uh, parasitic bee uh, Thurius hemolyensis, which is an example of a kleptoparasite that's wide ranging. And we don't know that much about its life history. We possibly uh, may find cryptic species involved here because it's, it varies in appearance and it, it really is in need of DNA barcoding and such. Um, so this is an uh, example of other, other non-apis bees uh, I photographed these during the bee course in Southeast Arizona, and many of these are pollen specialists. So this is something that's really prevalent in the desert, uh, dry regions. And this may be one reason why the bee checklists become very long in the desert, because they're resource partitioning very finely across uh, these different plants. Now, this contrasts with Singapore, where I am now, in the uh, most of the bees in Singapore are polylectic, and they uh, visit multiple pollen sources. There are very few oligolectic or very highly specialized uh, bees in that sense. But they do have a wide array of behavioral uh, adaptations and specializations. We found some really surprising nesting behaviors, like nesting in mud lobster mounds and things of that nature. And you can see some incredible uh, size and color differentiation. So Asia is the center of the blue bees and the blue banded bees. And also you can see uh, Mullerian mimicry among the large Megachile at the bottom with uh, black ones with orange wings. And you get both resin bees and leaf cutter bees with this uh, pattern. So um, in, in my lab, we're not just interested in the taxonomy. We're also trying to understand what the bees are doing. What is their functional importance? And uh, this was a really interesting case that was really brought to light by Zestin So of Singapore End Parks. And so what he found is that End Parks had been restoring a once extinct in Singapore orchid, which is the largest orchid by biomass, I believe, which is the tiger orchid. Normally, it, it, under natural conditions, it would be up in the canopy or sub canopy or high in the trees. But uh, they planted them down at ground level, and it turned out to be a wonderful sentinel plant bringing down these make highly bees that are usually inaccessible up in the high canopy, bringing them down to a lower level and where um, the team could uh, videotape them or, or video, not videotape, but video them and uh, photograph them. And so we were able to figure out the set of these mimetic um, leaf cutter and resin bees that are going to be pollinating this orchid. And so it's actually a reintroduction of a species of orchid that had been lost, but the pollinators were still present in the environment. But it wasn't until the orchid uh, was observed that we were able to find some of these rare canopy species, like um, the one in the lower right, uh, Megakali indonesica, that hadn't been detected before in Singapore. So you can see they come in a bunch of different colors. And the ones that are of the right medium size, not too big, but not giant, are able to fit into the column of the orchid and they can be effective pollinators because the pollinia attaches to the back. So you can see that there's a set of several species of both uh, potentially exotic and native species of Megachile that are uh, pollinating this plant. So um, now I'm, I've sort of gone through the uh, introductory phase there, um, and now I'm going to move on to uh, how do we amass the data to answer the question, are bees declining uh, globally? So the first thing we can do is to capture a bunch of specimen data, which is called digitization. We're basically putting in a relational database with a machine readable barcode, the label data about where and when the bee was found. And then uh, we, we uh, geo-reference it if it doesn't already have coordinates. 
So this is something that I did on a large scale with about a quarter million specimens that I directly oversaw at AM and H, and then I work with other partners uh, to do this. So here's some AM and H. Uh, this is American Museum of Natural History in New York City uh, bees. This particular species was mentioned a lot in uh, in uh, certain liter early literature, like the 2007 National Academy study, because at that time it was not clear uh, that this be persisted at all. It was thought to be potentially extinct. Later, it was rediscovered by Corey Sheffield in Nova Scotia, and then it showed up again later in Connecticut and Massachusetts and a bunch of other uh, places, New York. So it's not extinct, but you can see that at least in this particular museum, all of our specimens were very old. You can see dates like 1885. There are no recent specimens. All of them have yellow ancient labels. And so we, we wanted to capture this historical baseline as a reference point uh, to compare the recent samples to assess the status. So to get these public data, we put them into a relational database, which was customized for bees to also capture the uh, plant information. And then these are shared publicly. Our primary data integration and display portal is a website called Discover Life, and this is showing how they're displayed there. But once they're captured, they can also go into uh, other data portals like IDIG Bio, so we have an archived record set there, and then eventually they flow into GBIF, which is going to be the global repository for all of these biodiversity records in aggregate. So with these records, um, we have a, a pretty good idea of where that particular bee species was in, in the past when it was uh, collected, in this case, 1956. So this is what it looks like when we map them out across um, many collections. And uh, these are not all of the bee collections. This is only the, the part that was connected through my grant, uh, my NSF grant that was uh, using uh, Discover Life as a primary data integration uh, and error checking portal. So from this map, you can see there are uh, pretty good coverage for the new world, but there are major parts of Africa and Asia that are seriously deficient in uh, specimen uh, records. So each of the colors here is a different collection showing uh, where, where the records are coming from. So a lot of the global stuff here is coming from the American Museum of Natural History or uh, Bee Biology and Systematics Lab in Logan, Utah. So this is what it looks like when you map it, uh, uh, zooming in on North America and especially the United States. So it's very clear that with this set of uh, 10 or more collections, that certain regions like California have very good coverage from multiple collections, in this case, uh, BBSL and um, AMNH and also UC Davis and some others. And then the Atlantic Seaboard and Northeast United States also have good coverage. But there's huge parts of so-called real America, and you could also call, uh, well, I'll, I shouldn't offend anybody, but in the, the Bible Belt or the middle part of, of the U.S. that are really sparse in records from this set of collections. If you add in University of Kansas and uh, Illinois Natural History Survey, you start to fill in certain states, but in general, there's some persistent data gaps. So how do we fill those in? How do we proceed to gather data from them? So one approach that we took for this uh, particular grant was to try to get the so-called regional or minor or state university collections uh, captured in addition to the big global collections, because it's only by amassing these more focused collections that we get really dense coverage for, in this case, uh, Connecticut from Yukon in blue and Rutgers for New Jersey and USGS for Maryland, which is Sam Drogi's operation. If we just left it to the really large global collections, we would not get adequate coverage across the, the fauna. So what we did with this data was to get enough data from different time periods centered on about 1900 in the left, 1950 or so-ish, um, give or take 25 years in the middle, and then the more recent period. And we could then have a relatively fair comparison between the bees that were caught in different time periods. And this allowed for a status assessment that showed some trends like a potential decrease in large-bodied species, 
and northern species declining and uh, species with uh, short uh, flight season declining and such. So there are alternative explanations for many of these patterns that some, to some degree they could be artifacts, but this is at least a somewhat credible attempt to assess status in an area with relatively good data. But what do we do with the rest of the world when we really lack basic foundational data? We don't even have a checklist, or at least when I was starting uh, this effort about 20 years ago, there were no even vaguely credible checklists for most uh, countries in the world, much less uh, states. So I started out really trying to capture each species by country, and then recently I've become more and more uh, detailed to capture state-level occurrences, island, specific island records in places like Indonesia and the Pacific and so forth. And so this shows 171,000 unique records, which are all mapped on this uh, portal, Discover Life. And these are sometimes cited uh, as part of the Asher and Pickering uh, checklist, which is sort of a confusing set of resources that is sort of somewhat hard to understand. So I'll try to explain that a little bit later in the talk in, in, some, in some sense. It should be emphasized that these are unique records and this contrasts with the public data, which is the specimen records from GBIF and other big aggregators. So there's a lot of public data, but there's a lot of redundancy there because you may have a huge number of bombus and patients from say New York or Illinois. Um, uh, a lot of them are Apis mellifera records from say the UK or something. And if you drop those out or you rarify them, then uh, you have far fewer truly unique uh, records. Whereas the checklist, each one of those 171,000 is a different species by a political area or island uh, combination. So what I was trying to do with the checklist is to fill in gaps for places like uh, Indonesian islands or parts of Russia where the public data on GBIF are not adequate, also Pacific islands. Um, and furthermore, um, you can use these the yellow dots with our, the checklist records to error check and cross-validate and extend the public data. So in, in a paper uh, published in 2021 in Current Biology, uh, my colleagues uh, based in China, especially Michael Orr and uh, Alice Hughes, Alice doing a lot of the modeling, and Michael being another uh, B expert, uh, we brought together this huge amount of uh, public records, and then we filled data shortfalls using the checklist, as I'll show you, and we're able to create a global um, map and model for the bees. And the first thing that was really striking is uh, just massive gaps in public data. So this is when we take all uh, essentially a data dump of all of GBIF and map it. You can see there are some parts of the world, like much of North America and certain parts of Europe, especially Northern Europe and Central Europe that have good data. Australia and Japan are doing sort of okay. But most of the rest of the world you'll see is white, certainly including most of Asia, uh, most of Africa. So if you think about where are there urgent biodiversity threats, where are there serious food security issues like the Sahel or parts of um, Asia, you can see that our public data for bees is woefully inadequate. And you can ask yourself, how do we know, uh, we see papers about global declines of bees and trends in these, but the all-time uh, database, when it's mapped, looks something like this. And so one has to wonder, um, how do you assess trends when you don't have any records ever all time, not even one baseline record for a huge uh, proportion of bees across a huge proportion of the earth? Okay, so this is uh, mapping pretty much the same thing as it appeared in the paper. So on the left, uh, DB is basically all those specimen records uh, from GBIF and other sources. And again, you can see North America has semi-decent uh, coverage in general. South America is quite poor. And by sampling, we're talking about density of how many uh, records or how many points are coming from uh, these, these uh, political areas. So Northern Europe is quite good, Australia and South Africa. But much of the rest of the world is really terrible. And when you look at the distorted map, you can see South America is, is shrinking very far. And one reason for this is that until recently, 
when uh, Chilean uh, uh, collections uh, started to come online, there's been very little indigenous uh, digitization or digitization done within South America itself. And then Asia is basically a complete uh, wipeout. It almost shrinks to nothingness in this map, and that reflects, besides Japan, uh, uh, egregious lack of publicly accessible specimen records. And then if you look at richness, this is looking at species coverage. It's a bit higher for places like South America, and this is because collections like AMNH and BBSL have pretty good species representation, even though the number of samples is not uh, that great. And so that's why you see that discrepancy. And you can see uh, there's areas that we know are extremely rich for bees, like Central Asia and North Africa, that are looking pretty poor, uh, both for sampling and richness, and Asia is disastrously poor. Now, this is uh, what it looks like if you just naively make a model just based on the GBIF specimen records alone, and it's just terribly unrealistic. Um, it's basically a model of what countries of what climatic conditions match the countries that are able to digitize. So Denmark is able to digitize and Sweden and UK, and therefore those climatic zones are shown as being very rich for bees. This is completely absurd. Whereas desert areas that we know truly have a lot of bees are, are shown as poor. So one way to fix this is to use my uh, checklist. And if you look at the bottom panel, the checklist has much better coverage for areas. Look at Algeria, look at the Congo, and especially look at Asia. And then when you look at the distorted map on the right, the checklist, which is um, uh, the checklist coverage actually uh, builds Asia back up into something like what it's supposed to look like. And you see a map which is less uh, terribly biased and distorted. So this shows the power of the checklist. And the checklist, when you compare it to the public data availability, shows some incredible mismatches. So 19%, the outer ring shows the checklist proportion of species, and then the inner ring shows the public database proportion of data. So 19% of species come from Africa, but only 4% of uh, the specimen uh, records by this metric. Look at Asia, 15% of the species are in Asia and less than 1% of the available specimen records. So uh, look at Middle East and it's even bigger discrepancy. Now, by contrast, Europe and North America have uh, high data availability relative to the number of species present there, and that gives the investigators from those areas a huge advantage when they're trying to build their careers because they can get in a lot of uh, publications leveraging these rich data resources, whereas in the Middle East or Asia, it's essentially impossible to do that. So this shows... Uh, a uh, key finding of this global patterns paper is we were able to confirm some patterns that people like Charles Michener had as far back as uh, 1979 and long before that had described, which is namely that the bees like to live at mid-latitude dry areas, and uh, these are often your wine-growing regions, and then the equatorial wet tropics where other creatures are said to be most uh, rich are not especially good for bees, at least according to this uh, what we show here. This is a model that's informed uh, by these data, and it's made by Alice Hughes and you, in particular. And you can see, um, again, the amphitropical distribution with very high richness in dry areas of temperate South America and in the U.S. Uh, desert Southwest. And then again, in places like Spain, Turkey, the Near East, um, Central Asia, and South Africa and Southern um, Australia. Again, all of your wine growing regions are well represented there. You can contrast that with birds and mammals, and you can see that our main exemplar groups that are widely used for conservation planning and stuff have drastically different uh, patterns. And then um, here we can see in endemism, uh, similar discrepancies where the database is woefully inadequate. If you look at the DB, the middle panel on the right, you can see Asia is shown in a uh, very light color. This is the lack of public data for endemic bees of Asia. And then if you contrast that to the checklist, you can see there are actually a huge number of endemic bees known from Asia that are simply not captured in the public data. So if you use public data, Asia does not become an area of global endemism, whereas in reality it is. This shows uh, a more detailed map where we 
cut, uh, cut the political, we parse the political areas more finely to show the uh, Chinese and um, Indian primary divisions and Indonesian and so forth. And in this way, uh, we could show in finer grain uh, the richness and endemism patterns. This is unpublished work uh, by my student. And uh, the importance of the checklist is also shown here. All the areas that are in green have much, much higher richness in the checklist, like Central Asia, and only the areas in red have relatively high richness of the um, of the public data. So red has high public data, but all the green and, and, and yellow, which is covering a lot of the world, has um, more richness in the checklist and lack of public data. And then we did a deep dive into data quality and we found interesting things like areas like Brazil are really lacking in public data relative to the species count. And then if you look at the pie chart, you'll see little red wedges. And what this means is that all of those red wedges are uh, public data that we think are inflated by misidentifications or wrong citation of names. So a lot of the cases where there were a lot of species in the checklist were inflated by erroneous data. So one uh, outcome of all of this is that with the exception of New Zealand and Norway and, and Japan and a few, a very few places like that, for most of the world, the public data doesn't even accumulate to capture the known already described species, much less what is out there and undescribed. And so um, this basically, long story short, I think it showed the power of the checklist to fill in uh, data gaps. Uh, to explain what the checklist is, I studied essentially all of the B descriptions and all the monographs and revisions and such things, funnel papers that I could get my hands on in all these different languages and manually extracted with a critical assessment of biogeography as I see it, uh, the, um, the data that, that I found acceptable. And then it's all uh, shared, not all, a tiny fragment of it is shared on Discover Life and the rest of it is in my uh, source files that I share with uh, collaborators. So the small amount that's public includes the checklist of all the world bee species. And then it's also shared in various forms on uh, species pages. But one thing to point out is that this Discover Life content is the maps are mapping all GBIF records. So only a small subset of the records are um, AM and H. Uh, these records are the ones that are actually my records. So um, long story short, I get a lot of negative citations based on records that belong to KU, INHS, and other collections on GBIF, on GBIF that have nothing to do whatsoever with, with my checklist. And then also, I should add that much content is added by uh, people like Sam Drogi to build these pages. So long story short is I deserve maybe less credit, but also less blame for what is on Discover Life than I tend to get. OK, and this is I'll go really quickly here, but um, these are some testimonials to the power of the checklist. And my favorite is on the right, there's a, a Spicotes parasitic bee, which is actually named after the website which I think is very strange. A lot of bees are named after people, but this is one of the only ones that I think is named after an online uh, checklist uh, resource. Okay, so um, I mentioned before that only a small subset of the data that are in the source files are actually shared on Discover Life. It's like a, a very redacted version of what is already there. So this shows um, data that is not on Discover Life at all whatsoever, which is the type localities, which I have for uh, the world bees, and this is uh, mapped out by my students to show where they're distributed. Of course, when you know where things have been described, then you can go and recollect them for a status assessment, and you can also find places where bees have not been described, and you can go back and uh, try to discover new bees there. So she's also done uh, statistical modeling to show trends in uh, species accumulation or accumulation of descriptions globally, and you can see that uh, in some places, it's uh, really lacking, like Indo-Malaya, due to lack of capacity. In other places, like the Neotropics, there's an upward trend due to uh, an increase in taxonomic resources and expertise in places like Brazil, which is a, a good news uh, story. And then she's also been mapping the social network of bee uh, researchers, how the collections in uh, places like Europe and America are holding the type uh, uh, type specimens of the global uh, especially the South. And then uh, you can see how 
people like Cockerell, all the people they were uh, interacting with. So she has that for all of the B research, uh, B describers ever. And then we can map differentially where uh, different collectors have caught bees. In this case, in Asia, you can see Alfred Russell Wallace, the co-discoverer of evolution in red there in Wallacea, the, his region. And uh, one reason I haven't published the entire uh, checklist is that when we use auto format, uh, our code to parse it out into text, it ends up being pretty large. So uh, more than 3,000 pages in single spaced word manuscript with more than 1.5 million word count. And so um, it's kind of a tall order to publish the whole thing. So what I prefer to do is to uh, parse out small sections like 961 species from Morocco uh, to work with an array of uh, leading uh, taxonomists to validate and fine tune it and go into more detail like we did for the wild bees of Morocco. And I'm also doing that for a state checklist like Massachusetts and several others that are in the works. This one's already published. In this case, we reviewed about 100,000 uh, records, including uh, uh, iNaturalist records like this rare Melisodes. And so speaking of iNaturalist, I've been doing a lot of work there. I've done more than 1 million identifications of more than 10,000 species. This includes more than bees, also wasps and other stuff. And um, this shows just some of the uh, extent of all those red dots. It's a place where I made an identification on the site. So we're amassing a huge data set. We can use it for um, uh, uh, investigating things like nectar concentration in bees. This is an example with uh, Zach Portman. Uh, and after we published the paper, things got really interesting because in an ongoing project, we were able to amass after the paper, the really cool stuff came out where people were finding uh, all these incredible bees from all different, even additional places. So to me, the project got more interesting after the paper was published. You could see some of the amazing bees doing their behavior. And you can also crowdsource hard to observe things like gynandromorphs and such that, that are, um, you're very unlikely to see many of these yourself. But if you have hundreds of thousands of people photographing uh, bees, you can start to uh, encounter these more routinely. And we found some really exciting stuff in the uh, citizen science, like an uh, island endemic species that is supposed to be on San Clemente Island, about 100 kilometers out, out in the sea somewhere. Um, we found that in mainland uh, San Diego area, which is a very well-studied area, it's this uh, orange or rusty colored subspecies of Anthophora urbana. And then we could, uh, uh, we were able to send a team of citizen scientists out there to uh, document this. And this resource is only going up at a very fast rate in every single uh, continent. This shows some upward tr trends from an unpublished uh, uh, manuscript. And this one shows some interesting patterns. So if we look to the right set of maps, the one labeled A shows a large amount of iNaturalist records from most of the US uh, cities and from many other areas. The B, um, with all the largest amount of blue, that map with all the blue is showing areas where there are a high percentage of the available public data is iNaturalist records. So the areas in blue means that there's a very high percentage of iNaturalist as opposed to specimen records comprising the available data. And then C is probably the most important because it's showing in blue uh, that lower sort of middle map with the blue dots, especially in the Mid-South region of the USA and places like that. Those are places where INAT is providing data that historically did not have specimen data. So if you think in terms of, say, research equity and things of that nature, I think it's really filling in a lot of gaps. So um, we can then compare that to the recent review completeness analysis of the specimen data showing persistent gaps, which is in the lower left, which has just been published in Ecography by um, Paige Cheshire as a, is the first author. And then um, uh, James Hung in some unpublished analyses has shown a very good temporal coverage from the INAT data and also showing a large percentage uh, of species comprising all of the bee families, that not all, of course, not all the species, but a large number of species of each of the bee families is routinely identifiable, and you can uh, use both INAT and specimens to map them. And you can use it for species distribution modeling. I won't get into that. And in Singapore, we're doing that locally, and we're showing how adding in this, the community or citizen science data 
um, improves statistically improves the model and gives you a more realistic viewpoint about where these uh, bees are living locally within Singapore. And then we can use them also for various ecological studies, like how bees are distributed by habitat type. And um, all of this work is possible because we're not just doing the um, citizen science on its own. It's tied into an integrative taxonomic research program that involves DNA barcoding, population genomics. There's even some um, morphometrics, uh, dissecting the uh, male genitalia, all of that stuff. And you put it together and we have a pretty good idea of what the bees are. In this case, in Singapore, we can build out from that. We can do conservation assessments, which is now uh, published. And we can model um, undetected extinctions, which is uh, done here. And uh, where it gets really interesting is we move away from Singapore into more unknown places like Thailand. And by building this network and bringing together people from India and China and Thailand and, and Singapore, we were able to solve some very difficult taxonomic problems. For example, we noticed that a bee that the Thai colleagues had thought was a new species had actually been described from China, but it was a homonym. So we proposed a new name instead of creating a redundant uh, synonym. And uh, this is definitely advancing the cause of the wild bee uh, specialist group. And um, the next step for me is to move deeper into wasps. I won't get into that, but uh, we're, we're very excited about the wasps and have some papers that are in press or in uh, review about the wasps of Singapore and, and so on. And then finally, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that I don't have time to talk about, but I'll just leave with one final exciting thing, which is we're looking in detail at the blue bees. Uh, we scraped off the hairs of the blue bees. My colleague, uh, uh, Vino, brought them to a synchrotron and blasted them with high energy particles. And we figured out also from SEM, essentially how the different bees make the blue, which is pretty interesting. And then uh, with that, I'll, I'll thank you and I'll field any uh, questions that you may have. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Yeah, so I'll turn over Thank to you. Lawrence and to um, ask the questions back to you from the Q&A, but a reminder to everybody to, yes, use a Q&A uh, feature from the very bottom of your screen. It's sort of two conversation bubbles with the Q&A uh, text underneath it, and that's where you can ask your questions, and we'll pose them uh, to John Asher. Well, I'm I'm shocked. We're nearly at 11. That went so f uh, nearly at 12, I guess, Eastern Standard Time. That went really fast. My goodness, what a lot of work. Thank you, John. Okay, so let's see, questions from Flora Haidu. The Malaysian bees, has there been an estimate on the amount of bees that could be hiding in those forests, referring to the ones that were thought to be extinct? Are they considered near extinct or is it too early to say? I mean, I think for, for Malaysia, um, it's really too early to say. Um, Singapore is minute, it's a very tiny city state. It's about the size of, a, of one city. Malaysia is a vastly larger place. And um, just on the last weekend, we discovered uh, bees that are new for the state of Johor that have never been found. So we're still in the early discovery phase, if anything. Er early discovery and rediscovery phase. We're not, in, uh, we're not in any advanced stage. So Malaysia, there's a lot to be learned. There's a lot of uh, new, there's a huge number of new species for science. Um, there's a lot of species that have only been uh, known from a very few ancient specimens, and some of those we're slowly rediscovering, but it's uh, it's a very difficult problem. And for most of these uh, large and diverse countries, uh, we're just scratching the the surface. There's uh, yeah, if, if you look at say birds, and you can see uh, that they're they're still finding new new birds in in Southeast Asia, and there's hundreds and hundreds of people on the on the chase. And then bees, there's very few of us. And whenever we do make a proper field trip, we find uh, new things. So I would say it's a, it's a unknown. The, the status of a lot of the species is unknown. Um, there are species that Alfred Russell Wallace uh, discovered at certain places like Mount Ophir in Southern uh, Malaysia. And I don't think anybody has ever gone back and uh, rediscovered them or found that they were absent. They're just, it's just completely unknown. Super. Um, Martin Walfarder, oh, his, his question has just gone off the screen. Echo, um, did I understand correctly you were able to ID some of these bees by photographs submitted to a database, or did you analyze them by collection? 
I can answer that. You identify them by photograph. How many did you say you'd done? John? Of bees, um, uh, maybe seven or 800,000. You know, 700,000, maybe something like that. Yeah, I've done a lot. <laughs> but Z Zestin, is, Zestin is also a bee expert himself in his own right. And he takes super high resolution uh, photos with professional grade DSLR. So we can see a lot of very detailed characters. Now, the reason why we can identify the ones at this particular site is because it's only about an hour away from Singapore. And most of the species are ones that we have collected very extensively and we've studied them in great detail. So um, don't get the wrong idea that we're not uh, basing our work on collections. It's just uh, the photo survey is additional to a large amount of uh, collecting and, and uh, specimen study. Also, we study specimens in Malaysia at places like a Forest Research Institute near Kuala Lumpur. So um, the specimen work underpins all of the other stuff. Right, what a remarkable effort. Um, Chris Kreuzling, uh, when looking at coverage, for example, public bee data, how are absence records considered? For example, we looked for bees at place X and didn't find any. Yeah, that's a great question. So to do um, normal sorts of statistics, one would prefer presence absence data, but it's usually not available. So uh, long story short is there's rather little um, credible presence absence data. And so we end up with so-called presence only data. And this is why approaches like Maxent and things like that are often used because they're robust to presence only modeling. Um, as, as far as absence, um, I mean, for much of the world, we haven't established our first set of presences to build the first baseline. And so it's uh, it's a bit hard to say what uh, um, what's absent. And in, 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 uh, there's a lot of, of, of places where we haven't looked at all or we've looked so superficially that uh, it's uh, difficult to say. I can say uh, finding bees is very, very difficult. In Singapore, uh, we have many species that are known from a single specimen. Even though there are many of us who are quite keen on them, there's a huge array of, of nature photographers. We have a lot of singletons and doubletons all time, even in this tiny, well-studied uh, city-state. So um, when you look at a large uh, country, uh, it's extremely difficult to prove an absence of a bee, I would say. All right, um, Flora Haidu. I've heard that unfortunately most media coverage for bee conservation has been directed towards the honeybee, which is not native to North America and it's not as threatened as other bee species. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I think I already explained that that um, I think that the I, I wish that biodiversity focused uh, efforts would recognize other other things as important, like uh, the set of bees that has particular nesting needs and requires sand dunes or something like that. I wish that that was more of a focus. And also some of the threats that are relevant to native bees, like deer overbrowsing and things of that nature, I think deserve more attention. Um, to be honest with you, I don't I don't give uh, a great deal of thought to honeybee uh, conservation because it's not my area of focus. I mean, I think it's important because this is I mean, if you're trying to grow almonds in California, you need to have uh, thriving um, honeybee populations. But I see it as more of a agricultural economics problem than something that is uh, biodiversity a top biodiversity priority for, for me. I'll just leave it at that. I liked your picture of domesticated animals. When people ask me questions about honeybees, I tell them that's like asking an ornithologist a question about chickens. Um, so, yes, Wayne, to you, thank you for the great talk. Looking at the network of ID Anything. research and how much of it goes back to a few institutions, what needs to be done if we want to give more agency to researchers and institutions in the global south? Well, I mean, to be perfectly blunt, I think there's a lot of very, very serious problems. I think uh, the the so-called the global south, if you want to call it that, is most definitely very under-resourced. But even um, 
the national collections of the richest countries in the earth have not done uh, a particularly good job of doing what I consider to be some of the most important things like digitizing their type specimens and making that available, those images available and things of that nature. Um, I think that uh, there's relatively little enthusiasm and political will to do some of the things that I think really need to be done, especially the documentation of the type specimens. And there's much more enthusiasm about things like AI and finding uh, robotic uh, means to uh, get rid of taxonomists or something like that. And to, to actually uh, solve the problem is not, I, I've seen little enthusiasm uh, for it, I'll say that. Um, I, I think there's some very serious problems also because uh, of the general criminalization of biodiversity research. It's very difficult to establish collaborations with researchers in certain places because of all of the impediments to biodiversity study that may be well-intentioned, but they end up hurting the local researchers and institutions maybe the most because the global researchers, we can go maybe anywhere that we want to go. And if one country doesn't welcome us, we can go somewhere else. But if you're in a country that's not welcoming to researchers, which is, I think at least in Asia, many if not most of the countries are not very welcoming, then uh, the, the people working there are gonna have reduced opportunities to engage with people who might otherwise be able to really help them. Yeah, I like that phrase, criminalization of biodiversity research. Oh dear. Um, maybe I think scapegoats, maybe scapegoating would be part of it, scapegoating. Yeah. yeah, it's a problem. You know, some people in some parts of the world that are, you know, for them to do biodiversity research on their university campus is illegal. Um, for a high to the blue. Sorry, somebody's cutting out there. Um, do the blue bees create that color like blue butterflies with specific structures and patterns? Yes, they certainly do. Yes, they they have it's structural it's structural colors, and some of them are convergent on um, uh, birds. So and and uh, and also maybe butterflies as well. So the size of the spacing uh, will determine the, the whether they're blue or not. And some of them have the structure, but instead of blue, it makes a a bright white or an orange. And so we're looking at how. Uh, small variations in the physical structure of things like the scales of the Therius bees determine whether they're blue or white or somewhere in between. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to, you, you had identified a Therius there. I met, you know, did, did you identify those through looking at um, the you know, leaf tinks keys? Because I find them so, you know, he, he distinguishes such subtle shades of blue and pale blue and sky blue and the size of the patches you got a warm bee you can't you know you can't you can't estimate the size of the patches how did you manage that well my favorite way to identify bees by by looking in large collections so um the particular one that i think i photographed um was in the urban downtown beijing so that's far enough north that there's a limited pool of possible species and then when i went to uh when I went to the Institute of Zoology, they had a whole, you know, large amount of allegedly Himalayansis, and it's also reported from Beijing in in Leaf Tings revision. So that was, in some extent, um, it, if you go somewhere. Uh, so long story short, is because both the publication and the collection I examined, um, bees of that appearance uh, were allegedly that species. When it when it comes to uh, somewhere like Thailand, it's much more difficult because there's a larger pool of species and there's more um, possibility of rare and cryptic and poorly known species, species known only from one sex. The pool of confusing species becomes large and it's very difficult to identify them as I'm sure you agree. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Alessandra Ayala, uh, what advice do you have for a PhD student trying to learn bee identification? I guess that would depend where you are. But... I mean, I, I would say maybe start start simply and try to be accurate in, with a small number of group rather than, than getting too crazy with complicated things. Start start simply and try to make a useful contribution with a, a limited range of species. Um, 
for me personally, the most important thing is to have a good uh, reference and literature collection. So I would try to, whatever groups you're trying to work on, try to um, get the literature that you need uh, from the outset as soon as possible. And I guess in PDF would be most feasible. And then um, also having access to a, a reference collection is, is really crucial because I find it very difficult or impossible to work with the truly difficult groups without an extensive reference reference collection. So there's groups that I would identify, try to identify if I was at a big collection like American Museum, but here in Asia, I've limited reference material. So uh, it's very difficult to work with uh, certain taxa. You must have a large reference collection, in other words. Uh, God Otis is asking the same question that I was gonna do later. John, do you ever sleep? That's the question. Well, I, I better go to sleep now because it's uh, past my bedtime. One in the morning. Would you like us to bring this to a close? There's still a bunch of, of uh, 15 more questions that people have asked. No, I'm happy to answer more. I'm happy to answer more questions for sure. All right. Uh, Mark Chow, any recommendations on Brack? best practices on photo safaris, how to choose where to go, how to prepare, what to try to photograph, whether it's necessary to net bees, et cetera. Um, where, to, where to go is, um, I think most places are interesting to go because if the bees were known there historically and then you go there again, then you can do a status assessment or you can see if they're still there, which is interesting. And if they've never been recorded, then it's even more interesting because then you're putting new dots on the map, so to speak. So I would say almost everywhere, almost everywhere falls in the camp of there's historical data that you want to resurvey or there's nothing is known. So if whatever one of those it is, I would say it's interesting. Um, if you go to a well-known place, you're more likely to get identifications, which is good. But if you go to an unknown place, you may find cool stuff that nobody can identify, which is also pretty cool. So I'd say pretty much anywhere is good to go. Um, what to try to photograph? Uh, I would say you, you want to get a lot of different angles. We, we try to photograph the bees um, doing different behaviors on different flowers. So it's not just the bee itself, but the species interactions are very interesting. Um, try to get like the tail of the bee. Don't just try to get only from a certain angle, like try, especially if a make highly, you have to get different angles. And whether it's necessary to net the bees, well, the problem is it's illegal to net the bees in a lot of places, especially in Asia. So if you if you can net the bees, it's very, very helpful, and that will greatly increase your chance of identifying it. But if it's not legal, then uh, I would advise you not to do it. Yeah, not legal. Uh, Carlos Velasco, what would you suggest for local small collections with limited resources to start digitizing your specimens? Um, well, one suggestion might be to partner with a larger institution that may have some of the infrastructure in place. So um, when I was in AMNH, we partnered with, uh, for example, Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station, and we pretty much uh, helped them uh, with technical aspects like uh, Access, we basically gave them access to our database, which allowed it to be archived and shared with the internet and all that stuff. And so then uh, they had a very powerful tool uh, that they used through us. So if you have um, in your area another uh, institution that may be better resourced or have a longer history of this, um, that might be a good idea. Also, um, even if nobody's doing it for bees, maybe somebody's doing good digitization for other taxa and you could go along with that. I would say this, there's a lot of startup costs for digitization. So if you can find a group that's already doing it and uh, join their effort, that might make a lot more sense than starting from, from scratch as a small institution. And that's not, that's pretty vague, but um, that, that would be my recommendation. Uh, Barbara Blercher, I have you've done an incredible amount of work across the continents. It is wonderful that you've incorporated citizen scientists and legislators to create this. Thank you. That, well, there's also lots of congratulatory uh, and similar comments coming up on the chat, which I hope you will be able to read at your leisure when, when we, maybe if you're feeling a little down one day, just read those. It'll cheer you up. 
Um, can, I about, can I talk about sampling gaps a little bit? Yeah, go ahead. Um, somebody asked, what, what do you think are some of the key factors causing such large uh, sampling gaps? I think there's a, a bunch of uh, different issues. It's uh, technically, it's very expensive and difficult to digitize properly. Um, some of there's limited tools for data quality uh, and um, uh, data data sharing is is uh, more complicated than maybe it needs to be. Also, in some parts of the world, especially Asia, there's sort of legal impediments to sharing. Where if, uh, even if you have data, it could be that you might not want to share it. So I think people underestimate the difficulties and they see it as just a technical problem, but it's also a political problem and. Uh, it's not just you, you must have the money and you have to have the uh, technical ability and the capacity. And then you also have to uh, get approval from different uh, parties in order to map things in their jurisdiction, which you can't always get, at least in Asia. So it's actually a, a very complicated set of uh, problems. There's a lot of impediments, at least it depends on the part of the world. But um, in, in Asia, it's going to be difficult to... Uh, digitize a lot of these. Yeah, it's a pity, isn't it? Um, so well, let's see, where are we? Uh, anonymous attendee asks, where can I consult the paper about blue coloration in bees? Is that out or is it? Is it no, it's not published yet, no. Unfortunately, a lot of the interesting stuff is just in uh, various uh, manuscripts and draft forms. That was actually an undergraduate student project um, that I co-supervised with a colleague uh, who is now based in India. So we're intending well, to complete that manuscript, but he he moved to India recently, and and hence it's been a bit uh, delayed. That's uh, that's a pity. That I, I'm very interested in that particular topic myself. Um, Carlos Vergara asks, how do you deal with cryptic species? With what cryptic species? Yeah. Well, one of the most important things to understand the biogeographic patterns. So, without understanding biogeography, uh, things don't really make a great deal of sense. So, what 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 you need to be able to do is to take uh, whatever solid information exists, which to me would be the type inf type data is solid. Uh, sometimes we have DNA barcode data that's validating some of the cryptic species splits. And you have to be really clear on what's reliable and what's not reliable, and then attach uh, attach the other records in a reasonable way based on um, biogeographic uh, patterns that are known. So for that purpose, I think it's very helpful to look at better known groups. If you just look at bees, you might not be able to do it. But if you study birds and butterflies and other groups like that that have better known distributions, you can learn the general patterns and then um, you can take the reliable pieces of information that you do have, which could be um, type specimens or molecular uh, molecular validation, and you can build upon that, uh, keeping in mind uh, biogeographic uh, probabilities, I guess. That, that would be what I would say. So the frustrating thing is that when, when, you, when people do split cryptic species, usually they only work with a limited set of material, and then that leaves a huge amount of other material that uh, is of uncertain uh, status. And so I think by uh, considering biogeography, you can get a better handle on what, what's happening. Thank you. Um, Mohamed Alaverdi, uh, could you please explain briefly about citizen, citizen science in the B field? How was, how was the cooperation? What about the willingness and motivation of the people that helped you out? Yeah, so I think it's at very, very early stages. I think we're really in an early stage, but there have been certain people who are really keen who are helping out on a, a really big scale. So where things to me get really interesting is when you have multiple experts who are all um, mutually validating each other's records. So anybody, including me, who works on their own is going to make uh, us a good amount of records, I mean, a good amount of errors. But um, we have people like uh, Spencer uh, Hardy in, in Vermont and uh, Max McCarthy in New, New Jersey who are really super expert at identifying very tricky bees. 
And then uh, people like Joel Nalon is doing all the bumblebees for Eastern North America. So we start getting uh, four or five people who know what they're doing, checking these records. Um, it starts to become much, much more reliable. So I think part of the thing is to go from one expert the big thing going from zero to one is nice, but then to go from one to two or two to three, when you start having a group of people, um, that's when things really start to get good. So like, for example, in San Diego County, uh, we have um, enough people scrutinizing the records that we can find the really interesting ones and bring them to the attention of certain experts. And so we're able to get uh, really good uh, coverage. So um, I, I think it's something that you can't rush it. It has to grow naturally as people um, through experience, build, slowly build their capacity and skills. And then uh, some people get really deeply uh, hooked into it. And then um, they make very large uh, contributions, whether they're going to get credit or not when the papers come out is a, a different uh, matter. But um, there are people working really hard. There's a guy named Ajagu and he's studied, he checks all of the bees from the Indian subcontinent. So certain people like that are really valuable partners and allow um, a level of scrutiny of even the most obscure records that um, even a single person would never be able to do. So I think it basically teamwork is is key. Yeah. And you've built up huge teams in very difficult parts of the world to do that, which is congratulations to you. Um, anonymous attendee, could there be a bias by combining publicly available data that underrepresents certain taxa with collections that should be more unbiased when you are creating models? Um, yes. Well, how to create models is a whole separate uh, discussion. I mean, there's, I, I can only speak in a very limited way that when it came to, to Singapore, our, the model, the member of our team who's an expert in modeling applied uh, multiple bias corrections. So if we just plotted them naively and made the model, it would treat as absence the military areas that we can't access. So we had to bias correct by masking out the areas where there's no sampling. And then we had to account for oversampling of the popular areas. So there are known ways that you can account for um, the, the biases in in uh, collections, in but it depends on your approach. I mean, I'm talking about something like Maxent. You can um, use, uh, uh, you can, you, you can, um, you can uh, rarify the the points or um, apply different uh, bias bias corrections. But I don't know how I don't know how to say it. Sometimes you just don't have the data, and then you can't uh, make a good model. Thank you. Um, Stephanie Sandoval Arango, it seems like the lack of diversity that you see in South America is influenced by the lack of identification and digitization. Do you think the bees are still more diverse in xeric areas despite that gap? Or is it more an identification digi digitization gap? Yeah, I mean, that's a big, a big genuine question about what are we are we just seeing artifacts or are we seeing real phenomena and uh clearly it's a mix of both and where where you fall it, it's difficult to know i i think there really are more i mean given that i'm in the wet tropics i find it very difficult to locate bees here as opposed to say california or somewhere like that i think there truly are fewer bee species in these uh wet tropical areas if you look at the all-time B list for somewhere like Borneo, it's remarkably short, even though it has some of the highest plant richness on the planet. I think there really are fewer bees in uh, in the wet tropics. That said, places in there are places in Amazonia that do have a ton of bees and lots of undescribed bees and lots of undocumented bees. So um, the tropical fauna is underrecorded, but I still think that there's more bees in the desert and Mediterranean zone because there's tons of undescribed species there uh, too. Um, and uh, I think bees really are more diverse in xeric areas. I mean, a lot of xeric areas have low populations. They're hard to sample because the bees only come out um, rather rarely when it rains the right time of year. And so even though they're hard to sample, there's tons of bees known from there. And that tells you that maybe they really are uh, kind of rich. It's not, that it, it's not that it's easy to sample xeric areas, like far from it. It's actually very difficult. Um, 
there is, in terms of South America in particular, the biggest problem is that the largest collection in South America, Curitiba in Brazil, um, has not uh, been able to digitize. So what uh, a phenomenon that you sometimes see is that the smaller collections, it's inherently easier to digitize a smaller collection. And when you get to these giant collections, it's literally a full-time job for the whole staff just to keep the basic functionality of a giant collection. And it's extremely difficult. I mean, it's extremely expensive to digitize an extremely large collection. So um, un unfortunately in South America and in I think also in Europe and many other parts of the world, uh, some of the best collections are so big and it would be so expensive to digitize them that um, some of the smaller ones get digitized and some of the really big ones uh, don't. And I don't know, other than um, having a ton of uh, more money and resources in the system, I don't. I don't think it's easy to overcome that. Uh, following on from the uh, you know diversity pattern, there you you've worked a lot with wasps. Also, do you find they have a similar um, anti? What's the word? You know, you know, northern and southern diversity pattern, or, the, or are they more diverse in the, in places like the Amazon? Well. Um, there's clearly a, a subset of bees like your Meloponini stingless bees that are most diverse in Amazon and Peru and Ecuador and all the classic spots. And I think there's a bunch of social wasps like Polistini that probably follow that pattern. And Stena gastrini are in the wet tropics in Asia. There's So there's a set of wasps that likes the tropics, but then um, you have a lot of these solitary fibronids and Eumenine uh, wasps that that tend to thrive in the dry areas in the deserts. So I think uh, I think the wasps do follow the pattern of the bees, but then there's also a component of wasps that follow the more of the orchid bee and meloponini pattern. And I don't, I off the top of my head, I can't say what is more important than the other. Okay, great, thank you. Um... Tom Sullivan, I'm looking forward to seeing the Massachusetts checklist to design habitats in Massachusetts and selecting plants. Is it as simple as noting the existing plants in an area and provide them, or is it possible to enhance the areas with pollen plant data associated with the checklist presently and historically? Thank you. Okay, so the Massachusetts paper, the first author is Michael Beat, B-E-I-T, and it's already it is already published. So you can you can find that paper. It exists. It's already it's it's been published. And um uh there are actually existing resources by, for example, the Xerxes Society and probably others that and also some um Department of Natural Resources. There are existing resources that are specific and books, for example, that are specifically designed on uh, planting pollinator gardens for particular regions. So um, you can't just look at the species checklist. You 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 need to um, uh, basically there are people who specialize in that very question, and they've made available um, guides to planting pollinator gardens, things like that. So I would refer you to to that. As far as the checklist, what you can do is you can see the pool of species that might potentially be attracted and that might be found in your county, because we have a county uh, breakdown of species. Once you know the species is present, then you can look at uh, resources like various catalogs and some publications that tell you who the specialist bees are. And then you can try to provide the plants for those species and see if they come. As just one example, if you if you put the plant Philadelphus, you might get Chelostoma philadelphi coming to your garden. So there are a set of plants that you can uh, obtain. You can plant them in your garden, and then you may very well get the specialist bee. If you plant Enothera, you might get Glossum Enothera, for example. So that is is possible to do. Okay, we're getting close to the end now. Uh, an, an anonymous attendee, is it possible for a regular citizen to help with the digitization of data? Um, absolutely, it is. Um, so there are some digitization efforts like at Essig Museum in California, which is the UC Berkeley collection. And they, they have actively involved uh, people in parsing their specimen labels. So their model is to get multiple people to view the photos of the specimens, and then uh, you help them to essentially read the labels, and then they cross-check them, and they take the consensus, and so on and so forth. So 
that is just one of, of many examples of how they're crowdsourcing expertise in this case to interpret the labels of the specimens. If you're interested in, if you have a geographic skill set or something, that would be a good thing to do. You can also um, certainly you could help with um, identifying uh, things on Bug Guide or iNaturalist or sites like that. Um, so there are. Uh, I'm trying to think what the what the site is. Um, if you look up Essig Museum, you can read about how they digitize and how you could join that effort, or you could at least learn what it's all about and see if there's something similar in your area. Okay, um, from Manuela Silva de Amorim, uh, working in Brazil Atlantic Forest. Most of the bees they get are euglossines. Have you worked with euglossines? And is there a way to send the data to a database aside from publication? Yeah, those are good questions. So um, I have definitely um, worked with euglossines, especially in Belize and um, on an expedition in Honduras and some other places. Um, so the, the way to... To get the data, this is an important question. You can either get it from a data aggregator where you might get an incomplete or outdated version of the data, or you can get it by contacting the so-called data owner or the data maintainer of, of the database. So, if, if, for example, if you wanted data from American Museum, um, you, can, you can get it from a site like iDigBio or maybe from GBIF, or you could get it from the division there but I could also potentially help you with a data extract that's customized that might uh, be more uh, recent. So um, there's long story short, there's many different ways to get the data. And if you go closer to the source, you may get a more complete and accurate uh, version of the data set. Also, a lot of people have um, digitized uh, the digitized records that they have in-house, they haven't yet shared with the public sites. So it's important to realize that whatever's on uh, GBIF or other sites might be the tip of the iceberg about what data are actually available. So there's actually a lot more data uh, than are actually on the internet. So uh, I hope that sort of answered your question. In the case of Brazil, uh, I don't personally have a lot of data from Brazil, the only uh, data that I would likely have would be very uh, a smattering of very old um, specimens that that I digitized in in New York. Um, in the case of Brazilian stingless bees, I think there's much uh, larger resources within uh, Brazil itself. Uh, Molly Jacobson is the is the destruction of collections from certain parts of the world due to warfare. Uh, something noticeable when attempting to map bees globally or assess their conservation status? Well, it's actually very relevant to Singapore because um, at some point in their wisdom, when Singapore used to be part of the Federated Malay States, the Federated Malay State Museum, in their wisdom, they traded, uh, the Singapore got extra birds and they traded away the insects to, I think, Selangor or a museum in, in Peninsula Malaysia, which is now the separate country of Malaysia. So long story short is the historical insects got mostly shipped out of Singapore. And I'm not sure if it's proven exactly what happened to them, but I think a lot of them were destroyed in a bomb uh, incident in, uh, in Malaysia. So yes, there has been destruction. Overall, I think a lot of the countries did an admirable job safeguarding their specimens during the war. They tended to be uh, put into mine shafts and things like that. So often they came out re remarkably intact given, the, <laughs> given what they were dealing with. Um, I, I think uh, there's a lot of surviving old material, but uh, at least in Europe, um, the digitization is at a very early stage. And uh, a lot of the biggest and best collections have only very partly digitized as of as of yet. So thank you. So when I announced that we were getting close to the end, that resulted in a bunch of people sending in more questions. Um, so August Brunette, what have been some of the challenges of working on other wasps, and are you focusing on certain groups? Yeah, there's huge challenge. I mean, the wasps are extremely challenging. Um, in the case of pompility, part of the issue is that we don't 
um, have, uh, so very, I would say the challenges are uh, very lacking or inadequate um, historical reference collection because the very little material remained in Singapore. Um, globally, there seem to be fewer people who are uh, readily detectable, who are expert. So I, for example, I have no idea who's who can help me with the uh, umpility of Singapore, but we have very little idea of what they are. Nobody seems to come into iNaturalist to help us out, for example. So that's a challenge that's just a lack of accessible experts. People seem, the wasps are kind of paradoxical for me because there seem to be a lot of people working on them and they publish a lot of papers, but there seems to be rather little publicly accessible expertise. And maybe this is because a lot, a lot of the people are uh, maybe at small institutions or amateurs or something like that. You don't tend to see a lot of wasp experts in like top positions who are, have a lot of resources to spread out their tentacles. A lot of people, they tend to work quite narrowly. So I, I find it really hard to obtain wasp expertise. Am I focusing on certain groups? I'm mostly interested in carbonid wasps myself, as far as what I'm trying to identify. And I find that uh, also Vespidae. Um, fortunately, the Dutch researchers did a really super good job uh, describing wasps from Java and places like that. And some of their work is relevant to uh, Singapore. So um, the set of species that are shared with Java, they tend to be able to identify pretty well because of workers like Van Der Vecht and uh, some of those, Van Lith and some of those people who did like wonderful work. Uh, Nate Skill, uh, is there a database of these species and the specific plant species they visit? Okay, so the specimen uh, digitization effort that I was describing at American Museum, a major part of it was trying to capture the floral data. And if you go to Discover Life uh, website at the, for each species page at the bottom, it will list all of the floral association and cross link to the plant pages. So we have some tools that may be a bit hard to uh, figure out that um, allow you to access the list of plants associated with each bee and, and cross linked uh, to the plants. Um, so yeah, we're working on this. If you look at our bee field guide to Singapore, we don't have a complete list of plants, but we mentioned the major plants that the bees most frequently uh, visit. Okay, well, that's it. I'm just typing uh, an answer that I can to, to somebody. Uh, I just sent that. And so as far as I'm concerned, there are now no open questions. So, John, you had over 100 people an hour and a half after the talk started still listening in. You had 200 at the peak and more questions than any of the other talks that we've hosted. And this is, I think, number 13 or 14. So congratulations okay. on generating a vast yeah. amount of, of, uh, of, of interest, which I guess isn't surprising considering the amount of data that you've got that's global, that's a global relevance. But thank you for all your hard work on the bees. Thank you for staying up so late in the, at night in your part of the world and congratulations on a great talk. Okay, thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate it a lot. I'm, I'm glad you, you liked it. Now go to bed. Okay. Assuming you do indeed sleep. Yes, yes, going to sleep. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. I'll be in touch with some um, residual questions that come up in my mind by Zoom or some other method. Uh, my internet's connection is just okay great sounds unstable. good and uh, thank you victoria for uh, hosting and helping out by. yes thank you victoria um we'll be advertising the next set of talks pretty soon bye for now yes that's the talks are now available to register for so go to yorku.ca slash b slash packing and register for the talk you see this one in march 29th about uh phytophagy and apoid wasps and bees and then we have another one in April about squash bees and human interactions. And then May, we have uh, bees in the tap, you guys know, Tapano Taspidini um, tribe. <laughs> and 
more after that. So tune in, learn how to pronounce the tribe and sign up for all these talks now. It'll give you automatic reminders in May. So even though May's a long time away, feel free to sign up now to get that automatic notification. Yes. Thanks everybody. Thanks Great everybody. Job.